To answer your question, butterflies are modified moths. Well, now hold on just a minute. Here's what happens with your raw rat run. You go on to 50 different topics and use all these big words, and it's real nice to have a pause button so that people can understand. This is what professors do to their students all day long. The students can frantically take notes and keep up. They don't have time to ask any questions. And by the time they're ready to ask a question, they're on to 40 more topics. So m butterflies are modified moths. Well, let's talk about that just for a minute. Let's see, Bill, good to have you here, Jim. Let's see, Alt-DV, I think I got it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> to answer your question, you said butterflies are modified moths. No, Mr. Nelson, they are not. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. <clears throat> the most obvious difference is in the feelers on a mutter butterfly and a moth. The antenna. Most butterflies have thin, slender filaments, antenna, which are club-shaped at the end. Moths, on the other hand, have a comb-like or feathery antenna. Um, let's see, I'll show you. Here is, this is a moth, this is a butterfly, okay? Their antenna are very different. Butterflies are not modified moths. Each one works amazingly well for all sorts of their sensory systems. How would it work in the meantime while it's transitioning from one to the other? Being modified moths means that the ancestors of butterflies would have started with the moth structure, assuming that moths already had that feature by then, because we are talking about a very early split in the family. And then early butterflies simply lost fronds on the way down to the remaining cluster at the end, streamlining their current configuration without any loss of function. And this could have happened in whole or in part, even before there was much specialization at all in their antennae. If it works fine as is, why would it change? Did it improve? How could you study biology at the University of Texas and not know this? What is it that you imagine that I don't know? Since I did formally study zoology, biology, cladistics, and evolution, then I do know this and will be happy to explain it to you since you're the one who obviously doesn't understand any of it. Natural selection was only the first working mechanism ever proposed for evolution, but it isn't the only one. We know of a few of them now. Genetic drift, for example, is much more significant. This is an important lesson, so I'll recap this later on because it bears repeating, but to explain, mutations are much more frequent than you may imagine. For example, the molecular clock measures significant mutation rates, which vary depending on whether they're genomic or mitochondrial, and those are just the mutations that count for significant effect. Mutations don't work like they do in movies and comic books where one mutation causes a whole suite of changes. It usually takes quite a few mutations to see any appreciable difference at all. A natural selection is a process of population genetics and only acts on those mutations that have an impact on performance or reproduction. Deleterious mutations tend to be eliminated from the gene pool very quickly, if not immediately. Beneficial mutations have a preferential advantage, but even with that, it can still take generations to see those changes spread throughout the population. There are many more mutations that are insignificant and neutral. Now, according to this study, Humans average 128 mutations per zygote. That's just the ones that every one of us has to start with right from the point of conception because each cell has the potential for further mutation every time it undergoes mitosis. But those are somatic. Evolution is driven only by heritable mutations, being those that are passed down through the gamete cells, which are then replicated from the first division of the zygote and continuing throughout the development of the organism. So every pair of fraternal siblings already has an average of 256 mutation differences between them. Now, these are cumulative, but they can't build up exponentially because the parent gene pool has a tendency to restrict the degree of variance that can occur within the population. So those new and novel mutations will be effectively suppressed in the next generation, just as a matter of population mechanics, because of the recombination with other sexual partners. The norm usually overrides the aberration. But genetic isolation of relatively small groups now outside the influence of the dominant gene pool relaxes that restriction, allowing more mutations to accumulate with greater frequency. And these changes quickly build up to distinguish out groups from their ancestral or sister groups. So that in just a few generations, you'd be able to recognize which group some individual belongs to. And this is without any requirement of improvement. There are a number of familiar examples that I'll go over in the recap later on. For the moment, remember that evolution isn't just about getting bigger and better all the time. It's a theory of biodiversity, meaning an ever-widening variety of increasingly different lineages. So to anthropomorphize this a bit, nature experiments with every generation going in every direction at once. This is how it is and why I say that evolution is usually a matter of incremental, usually subtle changes in physical or chemical proportion, not in one direction, 
but where every sibling could start a different direction, bigger or smaller, faster or tougher, with any body part being a different length and or shape and running the spectrum of red and green, whatever. If those initially tiny changes don't have any significant impact or on survival or procreation, then natural selection will not apply, and they're free to diverge into myriad varieties, such as the hundreds of thousands of Lepidopterans, for example, with the different types of antennae seen on butterflies, skippers, and moths. Butterflies and moths are not the same. Okay? There are lots of differences. Basset hounds and dachshunds are not the same. What's your point? Neither one of them is the same as a wolf, either. No one would ever look at a wolf in the wild and say, that's a basset hound. Even you could tell the difference between a wolf and a basset hound, can't you? I bet you could tell the difference between a basset hound and a dachshund, too. If you can tell the difference, then they're not the same. They're a different breed, or maybe even a different species. But that's the point, isn't it? Biodiversity, the diversification of one kind of animal evolving into different kinds of whatever the parent category was, and the older the category is, the bigger it is, meaning the more it is diversified, the more grandchildren and great-grandchildren it has. Remember, we're talking about species here. And that also means that if butterflies evolved from moths, which we know they did, then of course you'd be able to tell the difference, just like you can with wolves and hounds, even though you know they're still related. Other taxonomic schemes have been proposed, but none of them is perfect. Both taxonomists and amateurs make use of the obvious difference between butterflies and moths. Go type in Google, it's G-O-O-G-L-E, and, and enter in the little line there, it says, what's the difference between butterflies and moths? There are many, many differences. They are not related. They look similar because the same guy designed them. His name is God, okay? Oh, really? I didn't know you knew so much about Lepidopteran classification. Oh, yeah, I, that's right, I forgot. You don't know Jack about squat. That's why you attribute everything to your magic imaginary friend. You accept that your dream of genie did not create each individual species of butterfly. You allow that they evolve from a common ancestor. But it turns out that moths and butterflies both come from the same common ancestor through the same evolutionary process, and that butterflies are a specialized subset of what we otherwise commonly recognize as moths. And following your advice, everything I look up on Google Scholar says that butterflies are related to moths by absolutely every taxonomic system ever devised. For example, in a classification of the Lepidoptera and related groups with some remarks on taxonomy, we read that Amphispidoptera is an insect superorder composed of two sister orders, Lepidoptera, that's butterflies and moths, and Trichoptera, that's caddisflies. Trichoptera and Lepidoptera share a number of derived characters, synapomorphies, which demonstrate their common descent. And since you don't understand big words, I'll translate it for you. Derived synapomorphies are characteristic traits that are shared by both parent and daughter clades and that were evidently inherited from a common ancestor. Those shared inherited traits are that females rather than males are heterogametic, meaning that their sex chromosomes differ. A dense setae are present in their wings, which are further modified into scales in Lepidoptera, so you see where that came from. And then there's a particular veneration pattern in the forewings, that's the double-looped anal veins, and the larvae have mouse structures and glands to make and manipulate silk. These are traits that butterflies, moths, and caddisflies all have in common that they evidently inherited from a shared evolutionary origin. We're not interested in superficial surface structures because we know that classifying things by outward appearances is inaccurate and lazy. If we try to classify things by differences, we'll soon isolate every man apart from all other men. So we look at core commonalities instead with much the opposite result and a better understanding. <clears throat> wing coupling mechanisms. Moths have a system to couple their rear wing to their front wing. Remember we talked about that when we talked about some of the insects. They have a special system that couples the wings together. Butterflies don't have that. <clears throat> the hind wing can be coupled to the front wing. Special little clips or reticulum and a little frenulum that clips in there to hold the wings together to add stability. Butterflies don't have that. How, how long would it take for that to evolve? And if it did change from a moth to a butterfly, that's losing something, not gaining something. Evolution doesn't require that we always gain something. Birds, for example, lost their dinosaur fingers and their dinosaur tails. Humans lost most of our hair and half of our musculature, and some of our genome still carries defective monkey genes, genes that work in monkeys but are broken in us, and positive benefits have been identified coming from that. Things can evolve to be bigger or smaller, or have more or less, loaded with extras or stripped down for efficiency. 
and sometimes eliminating unnecessary encumbrance is better. That's still evolution, even if it appears to you to be a loss of whatever you consider information. Okay. Uh, you know, the Grand Marquis looks similar to the Chevy Caprice. They're not the same. The Corvette and Corvair don't look much alike at all because they are different. But then again, they're both still Chevys. The pupa, the way that they go into the chrysalis stage or into the, uh, when they go through metamorphosis, most moths, moth caterpillars, spin a cocoon made of silk when they go into the pupa stage. Most butterflies, on the other hand, form an exposed pupa called a chrysalis. So the <clears throat> butterfly forms a chrysalis which is hard. There's the butterfly forming a chrysalis. The moths form a cocoon. They're not the same, Mr. Nelson, okay? And you can't, for, for you to just glibly say, butterflies are modified moths, that's the kind of stuff students have to hear all day long, and it's just not true. You don't know your moth and butterfly anatomy. Maybe not. So let's check with those who do nothing but study moth and butterfly anatomy and see what they have to say about this. Let's look at some more peer-reviewed studies. This one, for example, notes that since 1991, butterflies, in a broad sense, including the Hadeloidea, are subordinate in a large clade comprising also three or four other clades that are moths meaning that butterflies are nested within a clade of moths. And once again, I'll help you with the technical jargon. These experts in moth and butterfly anatomy are literally saying that butterflies are modified moths. That is exactly what this means. Color of the wings is different. Butterflies have extremely, oh here, most butterflies have bright colors on their wings. Nocturnal moths, on the other hand, are usually plain brown, gray, white, or black and often with an obscuring pattern, zigzags or swirls, will help camouflage them as they fly during the day. So here is a butterfly, okay? Greek butterfly. Some butterfly wings are clear. They can see through them. That's pretty cool. So those butterflies are different, aren't they? Yeah, they're not the same. So what makes it a butterfly if it's different? Yeah, okay. Butterflies have beautiful bright colored wings. The monarch butterfly and the crystal uh, goes through the stages there. And butter, you can study butterflies. They are not the same as moths. And for you to just glibly say that is silly. It's not me saying it. It's everyone who knows better than you. This time let's look at Lepidoptera phylogenia systematics, the state of inventorying moth and butterfly diversity, which says that the monophyly of the order Lepidoptera is firmly established by an impressive suite of synapomorphies of its constituent basal lineages. Once again, I'll dumb this down so much that maybe even you can understand it. That means that butterflies and moths are the same kind, and that those who really do understand moth and butterfly anatomy better than you ever will determined that they're the same kind through a suite of evidently evolved common traits, which I'll show you in a moment. Here's a chart to help you understand that a synapomorphy is a morphological trait that is shared by both parent and daughter clades. This article also talks about autopomorphies, which are morphological character traits uniquely indicative of a particular daughter group. That's what each of the differences are that you tried to use to separate butterflies from moths. Each of those differences is an evolutionary autopomorphy indicative of that clade. Those differences distinguish butterflies as a unique group among Lepidopterans, but Lepidoptera itself is identified by the core similarities that butterflies share with moths and that make them the same. It also says that the position of the group within the insect hierarchy is similarly well established. And what they're saying here is that they know that this chart is reasonably accurate, that you can use this to follow the evolution of these insects down to the crown or beginning of the family that includes both butterflies and moths. And note that the sister clade of Lepidoptera is Trichoptera, which is important because the next thing the article says is that it is strongly supported sister group relationship to the Trichoptera, caddisflies, constituting with the latter a high-ranked taxon, Amphiospinoptera, which means that moths and butterflies and caddisflies are all the same kind, too. If we look up learnaboutbutterflies.com, we read that caddisflies are the ancient ancestors of butterflies and moths. Their larvae are aquatic and live in portable cases constructed from sand grains or fragments of stems bonded to a silk tube surrounding the body. And that modern day bagworm moths, psychidae, still have larvae that lives inside cases. Now, this was written for children and is necessarily dumbed down to the point of absurdity, just like you. It's more accurate to say that caddisflies are karyotypic of transitional species, being the living representatives of the lineage from which butterflies and moths have evolved. 
Of course, we have fossil evidence of that too. This study says the diverse scales confirm a late Triassic radiation of Lepidopteran lineages, including the divergence of the glossata, the clade that comprises the vast multitude of extant moths and butterflies that have a sucking proboscis. But it wouldn't be a proper phylogeny unless phylogenomics provides strong evidence of relationships of butterflies and moths. In this study, the scientists report that they generated a molecular data set with 46 taxa combining 33 new transcriptomes with 13 available genomes, transcriptomes, and expressed sequence tags using HAMSTER, which is a program for searching and matching genetic sequences, with a Lepidoptera-specific core orthologue set to single copy loci. We identified 2,696 genes for inclusion into the phylogenomic analysis. Nucleotides and amino acids of the all-gene, all-taxon dataset yielded nearly identical, well-supported trees. Monophyly of butterflies, Papionidae, was strongly supported, and the group included skippers, Hesperiidae, and the enigmatic butterfly moths, Hadylidae. Butterflies were placed as sister to the remaining Obtectomerian Lepidoptera, and the latter was grouped with greater than or equal to 87% bootstrap support. Now, rather than translate all those big words for you, they drew you a picture. Look at all the beautiful, colorful wings on those moths. And then you have one subset emerging from within that group that became the very specialized subset that we call butterflies. Because it's not enough to have morphology, embryology, transitional species, and fossils, whenever possible, we have to have the final proof in the genome to close the case conclusively.